so we're crossing a, crossing a threshold. And, uh, you know, the Jews believe that this is where God weighs up what we've been like in the past year and releases what we're going to do this year. But I declare that when we come out from under the law, right? We're in Jesus Christ. We're already heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus, which means everything in the kingdom of heaven has been given to us. We have co-ownership. If you are an heir, you are a co-owner. And so um, this is what we're walking into. So, you know, we understand 5, 7, 8, 3, that 5 is grace. 7 is completion. 8 is a new beginning. 8 is also the decade of the mouth. And 3 can look like a man running or like a camel. And camels talk of, of wealth, assets coming. But it also, if you're looking at the man, and the Jews believe that gimel, which is the, the letter that this three represents, it's the letter Gimel in the alphabet. It actually is talking about a man that's a, a generous man running after somebody who's poor, longing to pour into their lives, which is basically the same kind of thing as the, the camel, right? Bringing the wealth and bringing the assets. And so 5783 is going to be quite a significant year. It will be bittersweet as all years are bittersweet. There's always stuff that happens in a fallen world um, that you wish couldn't, didn't happen. But I'm, I'm telling you that there's almost like a commissioning from the Lord, a charge from the Lord, that you are to walk close to him this year, that you are not to be distracted and deviated away from other things that to do with the kingdom of God. But there is a call for an intimacy that we have not yet walked into. There is a call to a close companionship and a, and a relationship that we've maybe thought about, have been on the edge of, but never really entered into. There is coming a supernatural acceleration for those of us who have not yet moved into an ascended lifestyle to move into that. There is a call coming out for the, the saints of God to actually grow up and to be... Um, to manifest as sons of God because creation is groaning. Yes. Creation is groaning. And so there's this, this call of God and there's a threshold. So at the end of the service, we've got a... Um, a, a bloodline yes. and we'll be stepping across the bloodline as you step across the bloodline you will leave everything from five seven eight to that side yes. all the disappointments all the frustrations all the failures all the lack everything that's gone on that has been a challenge and a trial drop it off as you step across into five seven eight three you're stepping over a threshold you're stepping over into something new and think about what happens when a couple get married they go you know on their wedding night or whatever it might be and the groom carries the bride across the threshold and you can either walk across this threshold in your own strength or you can allow the lord to carry you yes come on which would you prefer carry me <laughs> <laughs> and so this threshold is really important. Every time you cross a threshold, it's almost like a covenant in the spiritual realm because as you step across a threshold, there are watchers. There are demonic watchers and there are angelic watchers and they're waiting to see whether you cross in faith or cross in anxiety, whether you cross in fear or whether you cross in peace because the way you cross a threshold, particularly into a new year, and this is the Jewish New Year starting 6.30 p.m. tonight, the way you step into that threshold is the way that the rest of the year will continue unless you do course corrections. We've got this amazing opportunity to step across the threshold. How you step across this threshold is vitally important it's got to be done by faith if you don't have you can't tell me you don't have faith because Jesus has yeah. given us faith he's given us a measure of faith right so we have faith it's it's like okay I, if I've got any unforgiveness if I've got any bitterness if there's um if I feel like I'm in doubt or unbelief, then, Lord, I just repent right now. I, I just ask for forgiveness. But that repentance, remember, just means changing your mind. And so you say, okay, I repent right now of unforgiveness. So I turn my mind to agree with heaven. I just agree with heaven. I just agree with the word of God. I agree with Jesus. I agree with the Father. I agree with the Holy Spirit. I agree with the angelic hosts. I agree with heaven. And that is the power of unity that we must stay in. We agree with heaven in Jesus' name.
And so as we step across the threshold, there are watchers. There's demonic watchers and there's angelic watchers. And as we take that step across, we're going to do it under the power of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, carrying us across in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we go across that threshold, I'm going to talk about the altar at the threshold. We need to build an altar for, and when I say need, I'm not talking about works. I'm not, it was just a bad choice of a word. Um, but, but there is a, a requirement to build an altar at the start of everything new. And so we're going to build an altar, and I'm going to talk about why the altar is so important. How to, and basically, you know, like, like I made an altar when I prayed for Open Heaven Ministries for those 40 nights, circling it in prayer. That's an altar that I've made for Open Heaven. So any time I come back and pray for Open Heaven, I come back to that altar. And that altar continues to burn and it continues to be consumed with a holy fire. And so... You know, you can have an altar in your home. We can have an altar at church. You can have an altar for the city. You can have an altar. But an altar simply means that you have a dedicated time and space where you're sitting with the Lord. Jesus had altars. He would often leave early in the morning to go and pray to the Father. He had altars. And we need to um, seriously consider a dedicated time and space because God is doing something different. Have you picked up on that? When we said send the rain, and I read a book by Clarice Fluitt, do you know that rain would fall within the house when they had prayer meetings? Rain would fall and people would get wet with Holy Ghost rain in a house, in a prayer meeting. Like, who would like to experience Holy Ghost rain to that extent? Yes, bring it on. Bring it on. We want the supernatural, not necessarily the spectacular, but I want the supernatural. And so building this altar is really important. And it's important for us as individuals. It's important for us as a corporate body, as part of the, the house of open heaven. And it's recognizing the power of God, the power of the kingdom, and that what he wants to do through us and with us and for us and around us and in us is so much more than anything we could ever think about on us by ourselves, right? Yeah. We've got this dream and this destiny. We think God's called us to this assignment. But he's going, seriously, I have so much more. I've got an Ephesians 3.20 lifestyle for all of you. Don't think that where you are or where you've planned to be is where I'm taking you because I have much more in mind. And so it comes to a surrender. Surrender. You want to flow with the Holy Ghost, you surrender. And I have been doing... Interesting things. It's been an interesting week. Like, we've had the prophetic activation on Saturday. We had Kingdom Investors on Tuesday, Wednesday night, and then um, Jeff's graduation to heaven on Friday. It's been an interesting week. But on Tuesday, I had one of my clients ring me from another state saying, I'm an entrepreneur. And I, I'm, you know, entrepreneurs go for it. Like we drive things, we make things happen. And one of my guys is on a four weeks holiday and I've stepped in to take his place. Now this is the big boss that's talking. And he's only reached 20% of his KPIs and I need to get that up to 100% by the end of the month. So I've just got, I went in there to try and make it happen. Now he's a man of prayer. He takes a whole day every week during the week to spend eight hours with God for his company. So he's a man of prayer. He fasts. Um, his knowledge of the word is amazing. So it's not like he's a baby Christian or anything like that. He knows about resting in the Lord. He knows about waiting on the Lord. But hey, we're at 20% of our KPIs instead of 80%. So I've got to make this happen, right? So he rang up somebody and to try and get some of the KPIs lifted in one of the companies that they have an account with. And the manager of that account said, stay in your own lane. And so he realised he had upset somebody. So there was, you know, like, I don't know if you say grovelling, but, you know, like mending fences to keep the account. 
So he rang me and he said, how do I balance the drive of being an entrepreneur with the rhythm of heaven? How do I do that? Because being an entrepreneur, God has put that in me. And so that's a drive. You've got to make things happen. You've got to get the business going. You've got to get the wages in. You've got to get the staff happening. All He said, how do I balance that with doing it at peace and at rest? So I suggested that he binds his days to God's will, that he binds his will to God's will that he binds his heart to God's heart. We're in there anyway, but the soul is the thing that gets in the way. That he binds his um, vision to God's vision. That he binds his timing to God's timing. And so he talked about the things that he could bind to God so that he could walk in this out. And it's, it's made a big difference for him. He's at peace. He's not trying to make things happen. But things are happening with a, a, a grace and an ease that he's not had before. So this year... The challenge for us is that we cannot allow the unrenewed soul to cause us to make things happen, to push us, to drive us. The I shoulds and I must and I've got to do this and this has got to be attended to. I'm telling you right now, you've got to lay it all down because the only thing that needs to happen this year is what God wills and in the way that he wants it done. And then you will see supernatural results. There will be supernatural increase and multiplication. There will be um, a dealing with obstacles and things that, that just happens. Mm -hmm. But we tend, as Christians, tend to think it's about how much we've prayed and whether or not we've been in the Word or haven't been in the Word whether we're walking right with God or whether we've sort of messed up a bit, it's got nothing to do with you. It's to do with Jesus. It's a finished work. we just got to move into Christ and live out of him, allow him to live out of us, right? It's not, I don't I have so many Christians that tell me that I have prayed and I have fasted and I have sought the Lord. And I'm thinking, whoop de do. Jesus did everything. Amen. How about you learn to receive what he's done? Just receive. I have a problem, God. Here's the answer. You are not a beggar. You are not an orphan. You are a joint heir with Jesus Christ, which means everything Jesus has access to, so do you. The entire estate, the entire kingdom, you've been given the keys to it. So we don't have to stand there and beg. We don't have to say, oh, God, please, you're not going to meet the wages for the staff or whatever. So, no, he knows what you need. So there's two things. The Lord told me he wants me to major on for me because I seek the Lord at the beginning of every Rosh Hashanah for me. I see the prophecies that are out there, you know, that we've got to seek God for a, um, a new route of supply, um, that there's got a warfare for recompense and all of this. But what is God saying for me? That's what I need to know, what God is saying for me. And he said to me, Suzette, I want you to pray that I would teach you to pray. Because he, and I thought, okay, well, I thought I knew how to pray, but obviously I don't. <laughs> but he said, if, but he said, the disciples never asked me to teach them to preach. They never asked me to teach them to heal. They never asked me to teach them to cast out demons. They never asked me how to multiply food. The only thing they asked me, teach me to pray. So I'm going in and saying, okay, Lord, will you teach me to pray about this situation? Will you teach me to pray about this situation? And the other thing he said, not my will, not, not Suzette's will, but his will be done. His will, his way. So teach me to pray your will, your way. So pretty basic. I like basic. 
awesome because I figure when he's going to teach me to pray I'm going to soar in the heavenlies like I've never sawn before right I'm going to see things and encounter things and experience things that I never have I'm going to step into this airship is that what you call it heirloom what do you call it inheritance whatever it is I'm stepping into it baby I'm going for it because it's totally mine you know, I've got everything Jesus has. So I want the same kind of prayer life he had. And Jesus even now is living to intercede for us. Yes. Says that in Hebrews. Yes. When nobody you feel on earth is praying for you, Jesus is praying for you in heaven. When you think nobody's praying for you on earth, the Holy Spirit is interceding for you on earth. So if you've got Jesus and the Holy Spirit bringing you before the Father, seriously, what are we worried about? Seriously. Oh, I just want to, I just keep saying to God, you just slip me in there between Jesus' prayers and the Holy Spirit's prayers and we can just, I'll go in the slipstream. I'll just flow in that slipstream. You know, it's a, it's a whole new thing. So we've really got to reorient this thing, you know, the unrenewed part of our mind that causes us to worry, get frustrated, um, be disappointed. We've got to really change this. And Wednesday night I'm talking about limitless and I'm talking about um, a whole heap of spiritual things which I am finding, I shouldn't be, I'm saying it, I am finding great resistance bringing this out to the people. There's a real resistance in the spiritual realm. They want to bring it back down to their level so that they can understand it. Let's face it, you cannot understand God except in the areas he gives us understanding. And so there's a, there's a resistance in the realm of the spirit because we have so much technical difficulties which we've not had on any other night. But there's also a resistance spiritually coming from the people about this. Well, that's stopping right now because I am releasing this. It's the same as when I tried to bring in courts of heaven. The resistance was incredible. And I felt like I could be tarred and feathered by my own people and run out of town. It's not quite that bad, but the resistance is there. So I'm telling you right now that resistance is going because it's not the will of God. It's not the plan of God. It's not your hearts. And it's going in Jesus' name. And you are going to learn how to move as a spiritual being because I am over living as a human being. I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm a spiritual being. I'm housed in a body, but I am no longer a human being. And when we start to understand that and to move in that, things will definitely change in your lives. And so this is all part of crossing over, would you believe? This is part of crossing over, the threshold. Building an altar. How important is this year to you? How important is it? I know we don't pay a lot of attention, you know, to, to Jewish things as such, not in depth, but we do need to understand the importance of the festivals, the feasts. We do need to understand these things. We do need to understand God's calendar. So the, in Acts chapter 15, verse 20, the disciples, or Paul, had had a talk with the Jerusalem head of the church because Jews were coming into the Gentile meetings and they were saying things like, well, you've got to do this and you've got to be circumcised and you've got to do all these things. And remember, Paul was a Jewish Jew and God had called him to, to minister to the Gentiles. Peter, the rough fisherman, was sent to minister to the, to the Jews. And in Acts chapter 15, verse 20, this is the opinion of the, the Jerusalem council. It says, we should send word to them in writing to abstain from anything that's been polluted by being offered to idols, all sexual impurity, uh, anything that's been strangled or tasting of blood. That was it. That's the four things that the Gentiles have to restrain from. So it's not like we have to be Jewish-Jewish, but we have to understand the calendar of God and why the feasts are there throughout the year, every feast, whether it's Passover, Pentecost, whether it's the trumpets, whether it's whatever it is, the booths, whatever it is, Sukkoth, whatever it is, it's all designed to draw us back into a closer walk with God because, you know, God is fully aware of, of we live in a fallen world, that part of our soul is unrenewed and we can deviate and we can wander. So it's important to understand these things. And so 
how important is the start of a, of a new year for you? Yes. So in the Western world, we make what are called New Year resolutions, which I think last for me for about 10 days, maybe two weeks. And then I think, oh, I can't do this. I don't really want it that much. But I do want, I do want the presence of God more than I've ever had it before. Yes, 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 yes. I want a deeper walk with him than I've ever had before. I want to see the manifestation of the kingdom of God in our lives like we've never had it before. I want to see people instantly healed. Instead of it being drawn out, I want to see instant deliverances. Mm -hmm. The promises of God are there. But I no longer want a delay. No more delay. No, no more delay. Yeah. How many of you have had prophecies and you've been waiting for a long time for the manifestation of prophecies to come forth? No more delay. Yes, so if there's a, a delay, it's because we're not properly aligned. We're in Christ. We're, you know, we're all of these things in the spiritual realm, but sometimes we're not aligned in the soul realm or we're not aligned with the, or we're paying more attention to the flesh than we are to the spirit. So I want you to turn over to Genesis chapter 28. Because we are going to cross the, the threshold. We will be stepping over the bloodline. But when we and we are leaving the old and stepping into the new, but be aware there are watchers, angelic and demonic. And think about it like when a bride and a groom get married, the groom carries her over the threshold. And when he does that, she's no longer miss, she's now misses. No longer separate, but now there's that unity, there's that intimacy. And I'm telling you that the heart of Abba is wanting a deeper relationship, intimacy, friendship, whatever you want to call it, with us than we've ever experienced. And any time you feel that hunger in you, it's because it's coming from him, and that's what he's experiencing. What we feel, I just want to get closer to God, you know those times? That's a sheer reflection of what Abba mm -hmm. is wanting. You sense the difference in the, in the anointing? Yeah. He is wanting you in a deeper way, deeper friendship, whatever how you want to phrase it, than ever before. He is wanting to walk with you in a close friendship, like you are one anyway. But we don't act like we're one and we don't live like we're one most of the time. This is the Father's heart. Because he's wanting you to have encounters and experiences with him that will just literally change you for eternity. It will change you for eternity. So we're entering into a new life. And altars are important because we are the living sacrifice. Aren't we? Romans 12.1. We are that sacrifice on the altar. We are the sacrifice. So Genesis 28, verses 10 to 22, says, And Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. Now remember, Jacob has not been a good boy. He's deceived his brother. He's stolen inheritance. He's on the run. So it's not exactly like he's Mr. Christian righteous liver. He's not. Verse 11, he came to a certain place and stayed there overnight because the sun was set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down there to sleep in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood over and beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac. And I will give to you and to your descendants the land on which you are lying. 
and your offspring shall be as the dust or sand of the ground, and you shall spread abroad to the west and the east and the north and the south, and by you and your offspring shall all families of the earth be blessed and bless themselves. So let's just leave it there and let's just look at those few. We'll continue with the other verses later. The first thing in that certain place, that time of dedication of time and position to God for an altar, the first thing that happens is there is an activation of angelic traffic. The angels are going up and down, up and down. There is a release of angelic ministry. And it opens doors on earth and in heaven. He's on earth and all of a sudden he sees the door open in heaven, angels going up and down, up and down, the Lord standing there. He has an encounter and an experience with the Lord because the Lord stood beside him. In the Amplified it says the Lord stood over him and beside him. So you have an encounter and an experience with the Lord. So there's an angelic activation. There's doors that are open that have been closed that you never knew could open. And now there's an encounter and experience with the Lord where you actually see him. Who wants a face-to-face -face encounter with the Lord? Right, well, if he had it in the Old Testament, you can have it in the New. And he sees the Lord standing there. And the presence of God is there. And there is a prophetic impartation, verse 13. And the covenant of Abraham was re-spoken over his life. Who wants prophetic impartations? Yes. Release of the manifestations of covenants. So that's just the first three verses. In verse 14 it says, Your offspring shall be as the dust of the ground. You'll spread abroad to the west, the east, the north and south. And by you and your offspring shall be all families of the earth be blessed. So what we see there is there is a multiplication that happens. There's a multiplication that happens in families. There's a multiplication that happens. And not only that, but there is, it's generational. When you build an altar, there are some of the commentaries say that where Jacob went and, and had that sleep and built that altar was where Abraham had built an altar. So when you start to build an altar, in the spiritual realm, it is activated for future generations. Future generations. There's a multiplication, there's a growth, there's a release of blessing. And in verse 15 it says, And behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I'll bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I've done all of which I told you. So the great I am that I am is with us to watch over us and protect us, and there is the promise of the presence that he will never leave us and never forsake us. I'm telling you the importance of an altar in the realm of the Spirit and in your life will bring you blessings that you never even knew existed, but if you don't know what it brings, you can't claim it by faith. It's generational. The I am that I am. The presence of God. It releases so many things. You already kind of have it. It's already yours in the spiritual realm. But we're talking about manifestation on the earth. Who wants to see like backsliding family members brought back to the fold? Change in people's hearts. In verse 16, Jacob awoke from his sleep. So when you have an altar and you are there on a regular basis, what happens is there is an awakening within you. Jacob awoke. There is an awakening. And he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. Surely the Lord is here. I was not aware. So there is an awakening that comes that takes you deeper. There's a confession. Oh, my gosh, I did not know what God was doing. I was unaware of how God was moving in my life. I couldn't see what God was up to. And so there's a confession, there's a repentance, there's a decree, but it's a recognition. There is an awakening that the Lord is with you everywhere you go, that the Lord is doing things in and through your life that you never even knew um, he was doing. He does more behind the scenes than we are aware of. Yeah. Our Jehovah Sneaky. Yeah, thank you. 
Verse 17, Jacob was afraid and he said, how reverenced is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gateway to heaven. And so there is a, a, a fear of the Lord that is released. There's a recognition of the house of God. There's a recognition that there is a new gateway to heaven. Altars will open new portals, new gateways to heaven. It will be different to what you've accessed in the past. You've just got to read some of Justin Abrahamson's or Mike Parsons' books to know that there is beyond, beyond. Mm -hmm. So new, new gateways open up to new encounters, new experiences with the Lord. In verse 18, Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone he'd put under his head and set it up for a, a pillar, a memorial, and he poured oil on its top in dedication. So there is an establishment of a memorial. There is an establishment of a particular place in the realm of the spirit and in the realm of the natural that is an anointed place. It's an anointed place. And that's remember when Cornelius, when Peter was sent to Cornelius and he said, your prayers have come up as a memorial before the Lord. That was because Cornelius had built an altar of prayer and worship and giving, which enabled Peter, God to, to send Peter to him to start the Gentile church. Our church didn't start in Acts chapter 2. That was the Messianic church that started. The Gentile church started in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. And God God says, your prayers have come up as a memorial before me. So as we establish an altar before corporately, an altar individually, an altar in the family, an altar in your business, as you establish an altar, then there comes a releasing of a memorial that comes up before the Lord, which causes him to step out and do something amazing, something that releases favour, something that interjects newness from the kingdom of God into your life. I'm telling you, when you don't understand what the altars can do, and how they work, you limit, you limit God because he will not inter, interfere with our free will. He is limited by our faith. And how many times have you heard people say, oh, I don't have the faith for that? That is such a lie. God has given you a measure of faith. If your faith has come from God, there is no limit on that faith. If you recognise that your faith has come from God himself, that he's given you a gift of faith, it can't fail. The only way it can fail is if our unrenewed soul steps in. Right? We are the most blessed of people, I'm telling you. So blessed. We're so one with him. He's given us the mind of Christ, the faith of God. We've got the, you know, the, the, the helmet, of, uh, helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, the shoes of peace. We've got the shield of faith. We've got the presence of God everywhere we go. We've got the gifts of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit. And then he says in Peter, well, I've given you every single thing that you need for life and godliness. What he's saying is you lack nothing. And then in Romans 8, 17, he says, and I've made you heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ so everything in the kingdom belongs to you yeah. so do you understand what it's like when we come before God and say God please I need to be healed oh God please I don't have enough money to pay the bills when we come in like a beggar like little Oliver in Charles Dickens what is it Taylor Oliver Twist? No, yeah, Oliver. I'm thinking, you know, in Tale of Two Cities. But when Oliver comes in and says, please, sir, can I have more? We've got that attitude in the body of Christ and it stinks in the nostrils of God. He's our father. We're his children. We're in Christ. Christ is in us. The Father's in that and we're in the Father. We're all mixed up together. We are so one. And we just have to come in and say, you know, can you pass the healing, please? Like we're seated at the table. Psalm 23, we're seated at the table. Can you pass the healing? Can you pass provision to me, please? I'll take some of that. I mean, my kids don't necessarily ask at the dinner table, right? They just 
help themselves. Yeah. I'll take some of the salad and I'll take some of the meat and, and you hope there's enough left for the others. <laughs> like one of my sons used to have 14 wheat bix for breakfast. 14. He used a casserole bowl, right? 14 wheat bix And then he had 10 slices of bread for lunch. And I'm thinking I've got other kids to feed, yeah. right? But he never asked. He just assumed that whatever was there, he could help himself to. And we've got to have that same attitude, grateful. But that same attitude, everything in the kingdom belongs to us. Yeah, everything. No more begging. Just, I'll have some of that. I'll have some of that. Thanks, Lord. I'll take that healing. I'll take that provision. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll take the wisdom, God. I mean, it's, it belongs to you. Start acting like heirs. Start acting like it. So we've got the memorial there in verse 18. Verse 19, and he named that place Bethel, the house of God. So sometimes there will be a naming of that altar. It might be an altar of purity. It might be an altar of provision. It might be an altar of intercession. It might be an altar for your business. But sometimes you will, take, you will name that altar because that's where you go for that particular thing and the hand of God is on that altar to cause it to bring forth results in that area. Is this making sense? Yeah. And so, you know, don't be rigid. Don't come with a structure and thinking this is the way it is. Of course, there's a flow. The breath of the Holy Spirit makes it an organism. It's a living thing. You know, we've got to learn to go with the breath of the Spirit, follow the cloud, whatever you want to say. But this is not rigid. This is not structured. I have an altar where I meet with God. And let me tell you, this has played havoc with my sleep life. But the circling of Open Heaven Ministries for 40 nights has always been midnight. So sometimes Danielle's waking me up at half past 11, 20 to 12, quarter to 12. <laughs> um, but it's always been midnight that I've prayed for open heaven, always. And so it's just been, it's just been amazing. So, you know, like it's the midnight hour. Oh, my gosh, it's just such a special time to pray. Do you know in the early church, the midnight prayer meeting was the biggest prayer meeting they had? They didn't have electricity. They just had candles, I guess, or whatever. But it was the biggest prayer meeting at midnight. David says in Psalm 119, I get up at midnight to give you thanks. And so be aware that sometimes there will be a naming of your altar. There will be a consecration because your altar, well, this is, this is the house of God. Like with, I enter into my bedroom, which is where I do all my praying and all my study, and I enter in and I just take one step in the door and I'm in the presence. Like it's just there all the time. I just step into my bedroom. It's like, oh, I love this. So when you, you continue with your altar, things change. In verse 20, Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way, then I go and give me food to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. Jacob actually made a covenant with God. He made a covenant. Jacob made a covenant. If God will do this, then I will do that. A covenant. And you can make covenants with the Lord. When I go through extremely hard times, I make a covenant with the Lord. Lord, if you'll get me through this, then I'll do whatever. And it's not necessary because in a covenant, he's got everything anyway. But this is a particular point of reference for my faith. It's an anchor to my soul that I'm going through this. And I'm going through this with this attitude because I've made a covenant with God that if he gets me through this, which I know he will, then but my attitude will be, or this is what I will do or whatever it is. But I make a covenant because I need to anchor my soul, not just to the promises of God, but to how I live it out. Because it's real easy sometimes to give in to depression. It's real easy to give in to, into, oh, God, what's the point? Nothing's ever going to change. It's easy to give in, this is bigger than I am. 
So I need this, this sometimes that covenant, that written covenant with the Lord so that I can stand and stand well. And we are that living covenant, that living sacrifice. And then in verse 22, and this stone which I've set up as a pillar shall be God's house, a sacred place to me. And of all the increase of possessions that you give me, I will give the tenth to you. So when you establish an altar, it becomes a sacred place. It becomes a refuge. It becomes a comfort. It also becomes a place of increase and multiplication, a place of, of increased provision. And understand, and here again, when, ja when Jacob said, I'll give the tithe to you, this is not God asking for the tithe. This is the same heart attitude that Abraham had when Abraham said, God, I will give you a tenth of all. It was not God's request. It came from Abraham out of um, gratitude and thanksgiving for all that God had done. It was man to God. God, I'm so grateful for what you've done. I'm just going to give you a tenth. And it's the same with Jacob. God, I'm so grateful. I'm just going to give you a tenth. So when we establish an altar, and we dedicate that this altar is for the Jewish year 5283, that this is for God's will, for God's way, 5783, sorry, 5783. This is God's will, God's way. I'm going to do this altar, Lord. We might be, you might decide to do it weekly. You might decide to do it daily. Whatever it is between you and God, you work it out with him. But establish an altar because this is what is going to take you through in a, in a much deeper level, spiritually speaking, much more powerful way than you've ever lived before. And it's going to release blessings and things in your life that have been held up and delayed because of certain things that have not been right. It also is a real deterrent to the enemy. Yes. Because we always triumph in Christ. More than conquerors, overcomers. Jesus has given us all authority and all power to tread on serpents and scorpions and nothing shall by any means hurt us. But the power of the altar releases something in your life. So when we step into 5783, I'm not telling you that you have to do an altar. I'm just telling you to ask God. Because if I tell you it's religion, it's works, it's got to be between you and God. You've got to work it out for yourselves. This is your relationship with God, right? You've got to walk it out. But I'm saying that it will release things for you that you have no idea of at this end of the, the, the new year. I also sense that in this, this new season that there is a greater emphasis on Father, Son, Holy Spirit working together. Yes. Yes. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says, The love of God, the grace of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And I am sensing we've gone through a Jesus stage, we've gone through a Holy Spirit time, we've gone through a Father stage. How about we just bring the whole Godhead together and just allow the fullness of Father, Son and Holy Spirit to work in our lives and to bring about the power and demonstration of the kingdom of God. We diminish him when we, we concentrate just on one aspect. Not that you can really diminish God, but we diminish the power of his manifestation. It is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God. So when you come to the altar regularly, this is what I felt the heart of God was saying. When I was praying about it and, um, and writing things down. There is a, a cry in the heavenlies for God's people to step into a closer walk with him. Yes. This is his cry. He wants a closer walk with us. And it's not about us setting the agenda. And it's not about us saying, this is what it's going to be. Or, God, would you come and bless this? It will be about surrender. God, I just want your will. I just want it your way just want to please you father but as we do this i am sensing that we will be 
captivated by the love of God like we've never been captivated before that the love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit will be so real and so tangible because he longs to pour his love out on his children. And we're not really open to it and we don't really know how to receive it. But I'm sensing that there is going to be a captivating. We're going to be captivated by his love. We will be consumed by the Holy Spirit and fire. Nine o'clock in the morning is a prayer meeting, a, a watch, prayer watch that the Israelites have in the early church. And, it, and the 9 a.m. prayer watch was Holy Spirit and fire. Holy Spirit and fire. We will be consumed by Holy Spirit and fire. We don't want people to see us or to hear us. We want them to have an encounter with Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit and the love of Father. So the more we allow ourselves to be consumed, the more the people around us will be affected and the greater revival and awakening or whatever it might be will happen. We will have almost like a holy compulsion to live from that place of ascended with Christ in heavenly places. Not from resurrection, life and power, but we are even now seated with Christ in heavenly places. There will be almost like a holy compulsion to come up higher, come up higher. You will have audiences with the king. You will be given decrees over nations, decrees to governments. You will have an audience with the king to carry out kingdom business. There will be a, like we rule and reign in life now as a king through Jesus Christ, but there will come a deeper commissioning by the king to rule with him, to impact nations, governments, and the mountains. You will find that as you uh, stay connected to the altar, that there will be more of a, a constant and a clear communication with the Lord. I mean, I know that we, we all tend to talk to him throughout the day now anyway, but it will be greater clarity, greater understanding, a depth of communication um, that, he, that is for the mature. Because, you know, a father talks differently to little children and then he talks differently to the young, young men, but he talks differently to the mature. And he's wanting to bring us into that place of maturity. And then last of all, there is the, um, the, the access and the demonstration of the kingdom of God, the manifestation of the kingdom of God upon the earth will just be miracle signs and all the things that we've been wanting to see, hungry to see, longing to see will happen. But it comes back to whether or not you want to take on building an altar in the spirit realm. You might think sounds like too much hard work for me. Or you might think, yeah, that's exactly what I want. So understand this, that anyone in this room that decides to um, build an altar, the Holy Spirit's going to guide you. Do not compare yourself with anyone else because everybody has a different relationship and a different walk with God. So the way one altar works for one person, it will be different for someone else. We have our own altars. But as we continue to do it and we come together in the house of open heaven, then that adds to the, the altar of open heaven. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So no comparison, just as the Holy Spirit leads you yourself. So um, Shane, if you can, we'll just put the... Um, and then 
just the here. Yeah, just yeah, just, yeah. just along here. And then um, if you could just get me one of the brown paper bag things out of over there. Thank you. So when we, we're going to, thank you. Thank you, Shane. You all get one of these, right? There's and, no rabbit punches. <laughs> <laughs> and in it, there's an apple and a little bit of honey because that's what the Jews, when they have their Rosh Hashanah meal, they have um, honey, they dip their, their challah bread, which is a circular loaf, and apple slices in honey, and they wish each other a sweet year. So um, as you come out the front, as we're going we're gonna to move this back, um, we might just play that song gently in the background, Daniel, that we had before. And as you come up, take your communion with you. Step over the line. If you're going to enter into 5783, you're doing it under the power of the Holy Spirit through the authority of Christ and you're stepping across the threshold, aware that you are being watched, but you step across in faith and you leave this end, everything that's been a burden, everything that's been a trouble, everything that's been a pain, all the people that have given you a hard time, whatever it is, leave them this side. Don't come back and pick them up. Just leave them there. And then step across and step into 5783 and receive everything that God has got for you. Take communion. And then, um, Shane, if you can just bring those boxes up here, take one of those bags um, for the apple and the honey because we are wishing you a sweet year. A sweet year.